All right, welcome all you Chemistry 241 cool cats and kittens. We're gonna go ahead and jump into uh, some MO theory this week. Uh, Dr. Cook kicked you off uh, in, in the lecture to, to kind of introduce you to what we're dealing with here. And the, the real moral of the story here is we're going to move beyond thinking about um, atomic orbitals located on individual atoms and begin to think about how they combine mathematically uh, to form molecular orbitals. That is, that means orbitals that belong to the entire molecule, not to the individual atoms. And one of the most powerful things you need to realize about molecular orbital theory is there's a lot of hardcore, really beautiful, exciting mathematics going on behind the scenes. Now granted, we don't have a whole lot of time to go into all the detail of that because you have to really think about the Schrodinger equation, right? Because atomic orbitals are essentially, you know, solutions to the Schrodinger equation. And so what we're going to do is use uh, the Spartan program that we dealt with in Chemistry 111 back when we did IR, and we're going to use that program in a new way to calculate both atomic and molecular orbitals. And uh, I'm going to guide you through uh, this handout here. We're going to go through about five simple experiments here or activities, and I want you to follow along. I've got a copy of the worksheet sheet here, and I'm gonna give you some of the answers as we move along and help you out, but I'm gonna ask you to do your own work as well. So there'll be times where, um, you know, I'm not gonna go through all of this in gory detail, but I'm gonna get you started, give you a tutorial, how do you read the Spartan output, which is really important. So feel free to uh, pause, look at things, zoom ahead, go back and review, and I hope this will be helpful, not only for this lab activity, but the feedback I've gotten in previous years is this is really helpful um, in terms of being able to look at these orbitals and see what they, um, what the shapes are, how do you, de how do you uh, determine if something's bonding or antibonding, if it's sigma or pi, all these kinds of things I think will help you later on and help you prepare for the um, exam that's coming up in, in not, too, uh, not too many weeks. So let's go ahead, go ahead and dive right in. Uh, you know, you hopefully downloaded your sheet here. If not, pause and make sure you've got a copy. Um, or you know, if you don't have a printer handy, you can do it on blank paper, but it's gonna be a little bit more of a pain. So, first thing I'm gonna do is show you an example of a really just sim the simplest molecular orbital we can build, which is for uh, dihydrogen, right? Just hydrogen gas. And so I'm gonna open up my Spartan, and I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna start a new molecule. And this one's really trivial. I'm gonna go ahead and select my hydrogen. I'm gonna add another one, and boom, there is uh, H2, and I'm gonna move it over here. And you know, I, I like to see it more horizontally, so we're gonna move it that way. And I'm gonna set up a calculation. And I know I, I'm really sad that you guys can't do this on your own, but um, you know, you don't need to remember this or anything, but some, some things that are important because you have to remember that what we're essentially running here is a simulation, it's a calculation. And, and so you have to remember that there better be some experimental evidence that shows us how good of a model that we have. And, and you know, this is really important as you hear a lot of things in the news about these mathematical models for uh, the COVID virus and how it's, you know, when are we gonna hit a peak and what are these, these functions look like for flattening the curve? And with all this discussion of models going around, Spartan's a really good time to illustrate that, that Spartan is a tool, just like these models are for the virus going around. And so uh, someone famous once said, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's exactly right. Uh, no model is gonna be exactly the real thing or else it wouldn't be a model. And so the idea here is we're gonna use a simulation that helps us solve problems in a um, short amount of time to give us a way to visualize these molecular orbitals and move on with our lives to make some kind of meaningful, uh, useful conclusion without spending uh, years and years or you know studying the mathematics we need to do this. Now, granted, you don't have to spend years and years, but um, we just don't have the mathematics by hand that we need to do this. And so we have to use a computational tool and Spartan is that. So I want you to really remember that this is a simulation. We have to judge how well these simulations match up to the experimental data, and we'll do that in a minute. But let's go ahead and, and talk about how you, you deal with this. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a simulation on our dihydrogen, our hydrogen uh, gas over here. And I wanna, I wanna look at geometry, and I want the ground state, that means the lowest energy state. I'm gonna use the gas phase. And I'm gonna use, uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of different uh, levels of calculation. And so here's what you're always, weighing against, there are two big factors, right? The big factor is you're always gonna look at how accurate is my model and how fast can I get it done? 
And so those are always at odds. The, the more accurate you want a model to be, you're gonna pay for that in speed because if you want it to be accurate, that's gonna be a much longer, much more involved calculation with fewer assumptions um, however, you know, sometimes we want to balance that with speed. You know, I don't want to wait f three days for a calculation. You know, I want to make some assumptions in my uh, equation toolkit to think about how I can speed that up. However, every time I make an assumption to speed up that calculation, most of the time I'm going to be sacrificing some accuracy. So please remember that. That's really important. So molecular mechanics is a really uh, it's the first one here and it's by far the quickest and it's 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 pretty well you know it's pretty good for a lot of things but we really we really want to use a quantum mechanical model because we're dealing with molecular orbitals and so in order to get a quantum mechanical model we need to crank it up to Hartree Fock and Hartree Fock of course is named after you know the folks that developed this and and if you want to go higher and higher you're going up higher and higher accuracy but it's going to take longer and longer so Density functional theory is really, really popular right now. It's, you'll see that used in a lot of the research articles. Um, and then I think even a couple of you even you know picked a density functional theory um, paper for your re article project, which is really cool. And then you have these molar plesset models that get a little bit more fancy. And so we're gonna stay with kind of middle of the road. It's gonna give us fairly accurate um, um, you know, calculations, but can be done pretty quickly. And I'll show you how quickly in a second. Uh, so I'll pick Hartree Fock, and then what you'll see over here are what we call basis sets. And basis sets um, are the basis of your calculation. And essentially, it's going to tell you what atomic orbitals can you use to do these calculations, right? Because I, I, Dr. Cook told you guys that when we build molecular orbitals, what we're doing is we're building a mathematical summation, right? A linear combination of these these wave functions, right? These atomic orbitals. And so they have to be conserved and they have to be uh, used to make these calculations. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the simplest one, which is STO3G, and it uses the smallest number of orbitals. And why do you think I would use that? Well, we're probably only gonna be using the 1S orbitals for hydrogen, so we don't need to be trying to invoke P orbitals or D orbitals or F orbitals or anything crazy like that. So this will be fine for our calculations right now. And the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure, remember, this is neutral. There are no unpaired electrons. And I don't care about the spectra right now like we did in 111. We used to do IR and Raman, all this kind of stuff. However, one thing I wanna do is I want it to print my molecular orbital energies in my output. So I have to manually now go in and type that. And once I've checked it all out, um, I'm gonna hit submit. And we'll save it. Um, I think I've already got a lot of these saved. Um, yeah, I wanna replace that. Okay, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six, boom, done. Look at that. We're talking less than 10 seconds. That's a really fast calculation. Some of these, if you, even at the hartree fock level, if you do much higher sets of orbitals or these higher basis sets, it can take much longer. In fact, you know, density functional theory and things can take, you know, quite a bit of time. If you're ever really excited about this, you should definitely go chat up Dean or I guess soon to be acting President Feller because Dr. Feller has a computational lab. You go check out his computer cluster on the second floor, his research lab. It's, it's pretty, pretty sweet. I mean, he's got a nice, uh, you know, computer rig in there, and I'm sure he could talk to you. He's one of the uh, the big guns when it comes to doing these kinds of calculations on on proteins and um, various things and, and lipid bilayers, which he's he's known uh, for that work. So you can d definitely chat him up if you're if you're curious about that. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at my output. I'm going to go to display output, and you got some information here that's that's useful, um, but what I really care about, you know, you've got some orbital energies here, which will be important later on. But what I want to do, I want to dig into the the gory detail here of this output, and what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for this area right here, the closed shell molecular orbital coefficients, and, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And so what I'm going to do is so I'm going to leave Spartan right now. I'm going to take you back to your Word document, and I've exported that information right here. So the first time you see this information, and, and you know, since you don't have the software in front of you, I will provide this in, in fact, I've already provided it to you on the various uh, nitrogen and oxygen and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Um, or, well, not on carbon dioxide, because that one gets a little bit tricky. Uh, the other ones I've given it to you, but how do you read this? Well, what you're gonna do is you're gonna kind of look at this and say, okay, what do I have? And what I want you to focus on 
are the rows and the columns. And it's kind of hard to see, but this is essentially a table. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, okay, I've got MO, the number of the MO, and I'm gonna look over here, I'm gonna go across my first row here, and I've got MO number one, and I've got MO number two. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna look down that column, and that tells you about the information related to these two different molecular orbitals. And so what we're doing, remember, we're making MOs from the atomic orbitals. So that means we probably should have used some atomic orbitals. And what you can do is you can look down here and you can say, I did use some. And so here you see the first atomic orbital and the second atomic orbital. Obviously, you're gonna use the number of valence atomic orbitals that you have at your disposal. In this case, the only ones that are, that are occupied, although you don't always have to use occupied, you can use low-lying unfilled orbitals that you know we may talk about later on. But you have to remember that you're dealing with two times 1s1 for each hydrogen, right? Or if you want to look at it from a picture here, you've got 1s with one of those electrons times two. So that means you've got two valence electrons, right? That's really important. And so what you really want to be careful about is how do you read this? Well, we have two hydrogens, right? Because this thing looks like this, right? We drew it before in Spartan. And we have to call one of these hydrogen one, and we call one of them hydrogen two just to differentiate them. Obviously they're identical, but we have to tell them apart from a calculation point of view. And if you remember, um, in order to calculate uh, a molecular orbital mathematically, it's equal to the coefficient one times the uh, wave function uh, psi of atomic orbital number one, and in this case it would be the, the 1s orbital, plus the coefficient number two times the psi of atomic orbital number two. In this case, this is also a 1s orbital plus dot, dot, dot. And later on, we're gonna see some more complicated examples, right? And so you have a coefficient, right? Because this is a summation, and the coefficient tells you how strongly this atomic orbital contributes to the um, combination to form that molecular orbital. This is known as the linear combination of atomic orbitals, the LCAO approach. And you may talk about that in class, right? And so um, in this case, it's really easy. We only have two. However, something that's really important is that the number of AOs, atomic orbitals, must equal the number of molecular orbitals. That's because orbitals must be conserved, right? There's this idea of conservation of orbitals. If you have um, a, a situation where you can add them, you also have a situation where you can subtract them, right? It deals with this idea of constructive or destructive interference because again, these are wave functions, really important. Okay, so if you think about it, I've got the first atomic orbital here from my hydrogen and the first hydrogen is gonna donate what atomic orbital? Well, the first atomic orbital is gonna be a 1s. That's really important. Notice that Spartan does not tell you what the energy level is, that's really important. And the second hydrogen is also gonna give you a 1s. So I have two 1s orbitals. Now, what you'll see then is that we have two possible ways we can add these, right? And so if we go back and I'm gonna go down the column here and I'm gonna go ahead and, if you'll let me, I'm gonna go ahead and put a box around this guy because that's my first molecular orbital and this is my second molecular orbital, right? This is, I'm gonna call this molecular orbital one and I'm gonna call this molecular orbital two. And this is really important. What you'll notice there is you have eigenvalues. And eigenvalues are coefficients, and we're not gonna talk about those right now. So you know what you can do? You can just put a single line through there and get that out of your head, so don't worry about it. But what you do wanna look at is this next row where you talk about energy. Energy in the units of EVs. And why don't we just put joules? Because you're used to dealing with joules. Well, joules are gonna be, you know, like 10 to the negative nine. It's gonna be really, really small numbers, right? And you can look up the conversion for, for joules to EV. I'm not worried about that. The reason we use EVs is because we're talking about the individual orbital energies. And so we'd like to talk about it in terms of, you know, uh, roughly um, small numbers. And so here I would just say this is negative 16. And if you want to, you can do negative 16.1 if you want to. Obviously, there's probably a significant digits issue here. We're not gonna worry about that. Um, you know, I usually just go one decimal past the, the, one place past the decimal. So I'm gonna call this negative 16.1. I'm gonna call this positive 19.1. So there you go. So what you see now, orbital one has an energy of negative 16.1 and orbital two has a, 
an energy of positive 19.0.1. And this will come into play really important later on. What I want you to see here though, um, we're not gonna worry about these weird symmetry terms right here. This is so cool. If you ever wanna learn about uh, group theory and linear algebra, how it applies to chemistry, this is all where you need to be, but we're not gonna worry about right now. So what I want you to see here is that if we look at molecular orbital number one, it has an energy of negative 16.1. The negative number often signifies that there is a um, electron or two that are found or have high probability of being found in this orbital, i.e. that means it's occupied. If you look at this one and you see a, a positive value, that tends to, uh, to show you that that is an unoccupied orbital, an empty orbital, which is really important. Um, if you look at this, you're gonna see, okay, I've got some positive values here. And so both of these are positive. So essentially that means orbital 1s on hydrogen one and orbital 1s on hydrogen two, they are in phase. They are gonna constructively interfere, right? So what does that look like? Well, that's gonna look like something like this. Remember, if you have a hydrogen 1s and a hydrogen 1s and they have the same phase, positive and positive, or same color or shading, that's gonna give you constructive overlap and you're gonna form a nice bonding molecular orbital. Really cool. If you look in the second one right here, you're gonna see you've got, oh, you've got a negative and you've got a positive. That means that these two are not in phase. One is negative and one is positive. And if you look at the number, the number means they are contributing the same amount. So we can say they're about the same contribution. So if you look at these, they are gonna form a node because you're crossing signs and you're gonna get something where you have positive and negative. This is an antibonding orbital and that's why you can see antibonding, you have a node that's gonna make it higher in energy. So that's where you get the positive 19, much higher in energy. And so you can use this information to draw or construct an MO diagram, just like you did in class, right? You can say, okay, always draw your axis, right? And you've got an energy there. And in this case now we can say EV because we actually have numerical values. Now we don't know exactly where the hydrogen 1s is, but I'm gonna say, um, you know, yeah, I have my one hydrogen over here. I'm gonna have, I've got another hydrogen over here. And remember this is a 1s orbital. That's a 1s orbital as well. And they each have one electron. And I'm gonna go ahead and do my orbital number one, which is the lowest energy. So I'm gonna call this one, um, you know, if you want to, you can put it down here and you're gonna call this one, I don't know, negative 16 EV, right? And you're gonna say, okay, um, now which atomic orbitals contributed to make this first molecular orbital? Well, it was the two 1s's from each hydrogen. So I'm gonna connect them and indicate that their parentage, if you will, or who, who combined to make them, well, it was these two. And this is low energy. And remember, this is a bang on interaction. So this is sigma bond, right? This is sigma bonding, right? We talked about it's gonna look like this nice kind of peanut or sausage shape or whatever, nice constructive overlap across the two hydrogens, right? So that is a sigma bond, sigma bonding molecular orbital that belongs to the entire molecule, uh, really important. And then you're gonna say, if I have a constructive version, I better have a destructive version. I'm gonna put it way up here. And I'm gonna say, this is what? This is about uh, positive 19 EV. And that was also made by the deconstructive interaction of these two 1s orbitals. And this is gonna be a sigma star because it formed a node. You have this antibonding combination that's high energy. And now you can say, okay, now I need to fill in my electrons. And so once you formed the MO, the atomic orbitals essentially cease to be. We've combined them into molecular orbitals, so we only care about the molecular orbitals, which is really important. So now we have to combine the two electrons each orbital can hold up to two. So we go one, two, and we stop. We don't have to jump this energy gap. And this is the, what do we call this? This is the highest, the highest occupied MO, and that's called the HOMO, and the lowest empty or unoccupied 
MO is known as the LUMO. And you'll notice here that we have a gap, right? This is an energy gap. And that energy gap is called the HOMO-LUMO gap. And that's really important. And so here you can see, you could actually calculate positive 19, I'm just gonna round it to 20, negative uh, 16, so it's gonna be 20 plus 16. That's a gap, right? That's a delta of about 36 EV. That's the HOMO-LUMO gap. And that gap is really important because it can tell if this molecule is gonna be reactive or not or what's going on. The other thing we can look at is bond order, right? How many bonds are between hydrogen and hydrogen? And so here we can say the bond order is what? It's one half the what? The bonding electrons minus what? The anti-bonding electrons. And in this case, you have uh, one bonding MO that has two electrons, so one half, two minus, how many antibonding do we have? Zero, and so that equals one. So the bond order for hydrogen-hydrogen is one, which is what you'd expect, right? Because Lewis theory would also tell you that that's a single bond. Okay, so again, that is a very simple example, a very simple data table, and I hope that helps because that's really important. And so if you were to come down and complete the, uh, the table here, it's pretty simple, right? You're gonna come down here and you're gonna say, okay, for the HOMO, it's gonna be roughly negative 16.1 EV. The sketch of the MO, right, it's gonna look like a big kind of sausage. And then you're gonna have which uh, atomic orbitals? Well, um, it's gonna be, in this case, the hydrogen 1s and a hydrogen 1s, and I think that was what up above is like 50.54, well, plus, yeah, we'll say plus 0 0.55 EV, and this one was plus 0 0.55 EV. And usually what I say is, I, I use my cutoff, this number needs to be pretty big, it can't be, uh, any lower than 0.1 or it's not really uh, contributing because remember up above we said that the uh, these coefficients are these c values right these c values in the mathematical expression that's what this table is telling us it just tells you how much of a contribution uh, does each atomic orbital have and so that's really important and so there you go right and if you want to do lumo you would say it's positive please make sure you put the sign that's really important the sketch here is a little bit different right um you would say okay there's a node down the middle and it's going to look like this where you have one positive and one negative so that's going to be um, sigma antibonding this would be a sigma bonding and in this case it's still hydrogen 1s and if you want to you could say uh, hydrogen one, what do they call it? Um, yeah, you could say hydrogen one, if you really wanted to. We know they're both the same, right? We better, we could, we could label them if we wanna be really careful. Hydrogen two, that was a one S, and that was what, 1.2, was it 1.25? Yeah, 1.25, 1.25. Oh, goodness, and I made a mistake. Uh, these are coefficient values, I am really sorry. These are not energies. We should not be putting energy there. I got in a hurry, apologies. These are just mathematical coefficients. They are essentially just proportionality constants. We do not need a, a unit on those. Sorry about that. Got in a hurry. Okay, there we go. So I think that looks good. And so what you're seeing here is this is how you can use Spartan data to really get a handle on um, maybe how you know these MOs look in ways that you wouldn't just be able to think about on your own. And so obviously hydrogen is a really trivial, simple example, but as we move on, I think you'll appreciate how powerful Spartan can be. And later on, we're gonna have to uh, rein this in and say, does Spartan do us a good job or is it really just blowing sunshine our way? What is the experimental evidence we need to, to show that this is a, a, something we should take seriously? What is the support from experiments that show Spartan does a pretty good job? Okay. So the next one we're gonna do is nitrogen. And nitrogen is done in a very similar way. And so what we're gonna do, um, I'm gonna bounce back to, to Spartan here for a second. I'm gonna close this one out and I'm gonna start uh, nitrogen. So I'm gonna grab that, put a nitrogen there, I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see it, and I'll rotate it over here a little bit. Eh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, there we go. And I'm gonna do the same kind of calculation. So I'm gonna calculate, I'm gonna do Hartree-Fock the exact same way I did before. 
I'm gonna go ahead and do print mo, print mo, so I can see that nice output. Make sure it's a neutral, there are no unpaired electrons, and I'm gonna submit. Um, nitrogen's here, um, there we go, I'll save that one. Don't worry, I'm not gonna do this every time. I just wanted to show you some examples of how you would do this calculation. Boom, really fast. Okay, so let's take a look now at the output and we'll jump to that first. And so if we go to the output, you'll see, now in this case, unlike the previous case, we have a lot more orbitals, right? Uh, we're not just dealing with one S's, now we're dealing with what? Two S's and two P's, because we're always gonna be dealing with the valence atomic orbitals, because they're the ones that participate in bonding. And so if we look through here, you'll say, oh my, um, we went from two orbitals to 10 orbitals. And you might say, well, why are there 10? Well, um, let's think about that. You know, how many uh, valence electrons are in um, nitrogen, right? We need to think about that. And so we'll, we'll, we'll think about this in a second. But for right now, all I want to show you is that you can get this information pretty easily and pretty darn quickly. You get spoiled by Spartan very quickly because you get a lot of information. Uh, but it's kind of a little bit more difficult to kind of weave through this. And so I'm gonna go ahead and bounce back to the Word document and help you navigate this. And this is one where you really wanna pay attention because I am not gonna do all of these for you. You need to kind of learn this method with hydrogen and nitrogen, and then I'm gonna kind of turn you loose on the, the next couple. Okay, so first thing you wanna look at is very, very important. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, remember that these numbers indicate the number of each MO we're dealing with. And then the rows across here are gonna show you the energy in EVs. Now remember, the other thing we can do is we can get rid of the eigenvalues. We don't really care right now about the eigenvalues. When you get onto PCHEM, you might later on, but for us right now, we're not gonna worry about it because we've got a lot of information here. There's a lot of numbers here that can kind of freak you out. So again, these are your, your MOs, right? There you go, so we got 10. At first, that looks like a lot. And, you know, it can be a little daunting, but let's kind of think about what we got here. Let's look at the energies here. What do you notice? This one's negative, wow, negative 422? Negative 422, and then we jump up to negative 30. Whoa, what's going on here? Well, that's a little bit disconcerting, but when you see these big numbers, they should give you a big idea, a light bulb should go off in your head that something's something's weird here, and, and let's look at this. So we know that we've got what? We've got two nitrogens. We've got the first nitrogen and the second nitrogen, just like we had in hydrogen, right? No different. However, the nitrogen brings more electrons and more orbitals to the table than hydrogen does. That should be brutally honest here, brutally obvious. Okay, now, one thing Spartan does not do is it does not label the energies, just like we saw up above for hydrogen. So the first nitrogen, so this is nitrogen uh, number one, and this is nitrogen number two. They're essentially identical, but we have to interact with both of them. Now, this is nitrogen 1s1, so they put the number on the back here. And then we have, what's the next one? That would be 2s, 2pz, 2py, I'm sorry, 2px, 2py, 2bz. Really important, same thing here. 1s, 2s, 2px, 2py, and 2pz. What do you notice here? Well, I hope you notice that this first one, the 1s, the 1s orbital is what? The 1s orbital is a core electron. It does not participate. That's really important, right? And so if you think about that, that means that, wait a minute, what's a 1s orbital doing? And in fact, if you look at this first orbital, what do you notice? If you look at all of these, what did I tell you? Small numbers don't participate. What's the only big one here? Yeah, that one, that one. No, 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 no. So these small numbers, again, if you're a smaller, right, if you're smaller than 0.1, you probably don't get to play. Not a, not a, deep, not a, not a big deal, right? So I'll say no real significant contribution. You can ignore it. So if it's that small, get rid of it, 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 get rid of it. There you go. So the only ones left then are the 1s orbitals. So guess what? 
1s orbitals are core electrons. They do not get involved in bonding at all. We only want to participate and look at the ones that participate. We only want to look at the valence. So what does that mean? This, these 1s orbitals, we don't care. We don't care about that orbital at all because guess what? It's not a bonding or an antibonding orbital. It's a non-bonding core electron. It has no role in our MO diagram. And that, my friends, is why this value is so low because core electrons are buried deeper in the atom. They're closer to the nucleus. That means their energies are so much lower. And so these high numbers, whenever you see something in the, in the hundreds, just get rid of it. It is a core electron, right? So this would be core electrons. We do not care about them. This one here, negative 421. Again, there's a 1s and a 1s. Don't worry about it. We don't care about core electrons. So what you wanna start doing is looking at the ones that are valence. And so these are valence, right? So that means three through 10 are gonna be our focus. That gets rid of a lot of wasted space. Plus, guess what we can do now? If we know that this one, one, is a 1s orbital, we can just get rid of it because core electrons will not participate, all right? 1s, get rid of that 1s all the way across. Now here you'll see some participation. I would argue that that's actually a little bit of an indicator of the fact that um, the Spartan calculation is, is using those core electrons and it probably shouldn't be. And we could probably use a higher level calculation to avoid that, but for right now, don't worry about it. Same thing for this uh, atomic orbital number six, that is a 1s orbital. So we're gonna go ahead and get rid of that one. Don't wanna deal with 1s orbitals down here as well. So I'm gonna get rid of that, get rid of that 1s orbital. And boom, we've, we've made our life a lot easier. And again, don't worry about a lot of this stuff until right, we might come back to some of this in a minute, but right now don't worry about it. So I'm gonna start looking at orbital number three. And I'm gonna go look at the orbital energy, negative 38, okay, okay. And here I go to this next one. So what do you notice? A negative 38 is pretty low. I bet that's a really stable, my guess is things that are really low in energy are probably gonna be more bonding, right? As we saw in hydrogen, things that are high up in energy are gonna be anti-bonding typically. And remember, what is that distinction between, remember the sign, look at the sign, negative, 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 negative. Oh, look at that, there's our first positive. That's a positive, that's a positive. So what I wanna do is I wanna cut right here. Whenever I see my jump from negative to positive, that tells me what? That tells me I went from my highest occupied, right? Remember those negative numbers tell you those orbitals, those molecular orbitals are probably occupied to my first unoccupied. And that means what? That means this is our, uh, if I can write correctly today, uh, erase that mess right there. I'll use the same color here. Um, this is going to be the highest occupied molecular orbital, right? The highest negative number. And then the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, the lowest positive number, there's my homo lumo gap. And you could calculate that, right? That's what? That's essentially seven minus negative 14. That's around 21 for that homo lumo gap. Pretty cool. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, okay, well, now I can name each of these going up in order. So this is LUMO, eight was LUMO, nine is eight plus one, so I will call this LUMO plus one, and this is eight plus two, so I'm gonna call this LUMO plus two. Same thing down here, number seven is my HOMO, so number seven minus one is six, so HOMO minus one, number five would be HOMO, minus two, number four would be homo minus one, or sorry, minus three, excuse me, can't count. And then finally the last one is homo minus four. So there you go, that's a new way to name them and that's gonna be really, really important as we think about what these look like and what they are. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna start to look at these. And so let's look at this, uh, this first one. I'm gonna look at homo by itself right here, uh, just homo uh, number seven, right? So what do I have here? I've got what? I've got, um, I should probably label these, right? So it's a 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz, 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz. Okay, so what I can do now is I can say, okay, um, 
obviously there are some that don't contribute at all, right? These zeros, we don't have to worry about that one, don't have to worry about that one. And so what do we have here? We've got this really cool thing where I've got a combination of uh, 2s, right? If I'm gonna label these, I'd say the 2s contributes, and then I'm gonna say that the 2p, looks like 2pz contributes on both atoms, right? So if you look at that one and you look at this one here, kind of cool. Now you'll notice that the 2pzs are kind of opposite in signs, so that's gonna be interesting. So we'll look at that in a minute. So let's go ahead and jump back to Spartan and see what that looks like. So we're gonna look, be looking for 2s and 2pz. So I'm gonna jump over here to Spartan. And I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna look and close that output. And I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna look at a surface. And so I want Spartan to draw me the homo. Okay, so there we go. That's what it looks like. And you might say, okay, what am I looking at here? What am I looking at here? Okay, well, I can look at maybe a little bit better picture if I look at the transparent version. Okay, there you go. You can kind of see the atom now, right? And so if you look at this, in a way, you've got on the outsides, on the outsides, right, you've got some of this, this, um, you know, the lobe over here, and then we've got two nodes. And this is really important, right? If you look here, the node, right, tells you what? The node tells you when you go from, if you wanna call the red positive and the blue negative or vice versa, doesn't really matter to me, but anytime you change color, you have to go through a node, right? Because you're looking at the amplitude of the wave function. And so if you're looking at going from say negative to positive, you had to go through zero and zero is a node, right? That's really important if you think about it as a wave function. And so here you're gonna say, okay, it looks to me like we've got some information here where I've got something and you've got a mixture here. So maybe I can convince you here that what do we have? We have the we said we had what, the S's and the P's. I would argue for this one, the P's are actually a little bit higher in energy. And so if we wanna think about that, we can say, okay, well, um, this one looks like, I would say there is mixing between the S and the P, which is a little bit weird, but I think if you remember, if we kind of think about what we can draw here, we can say, okay, well, wait a minute here, wait a minute, we can think about this. Um, how can we mix two P orbitals? Well, let's, let's see here. Um, well, you know, we could do something kind of like this. We could take a P orbital on the first nitrogen and we could take a P orbital on the other nitrogen and look at that, there'd be some overlap here, right? Okay, and so if we were to add these in a constructive way, wouldn't it look something where these are gonna overlap, where we could call this positive negative, negative, positive. Now you'll see here that we had to um, basically invert one to get it to have the right orientation so that the two negatives um, overlap, right? And so uh, we could call this blue for the sake of example from Spartan, right? And so now if you combine those, aren't you gonna get something that kind of looks like, uh, let's see, my pen's not doing so well. Yeah, I think that looks kind of cool. And if you wanted to, right, if you wanted to color it, you could say, oh, there's some color here. There's some color here. Here's some color here. And you could go back and you could say, okay, well, I've got a node, right? Node here. There you go, right? So to me, notice the node fits, it hits right on the atom. So that's okay. That's really the same node we had before, right? We had the node here for the uh, p orbitals that already um, were there. So we didn't make any new nodes, but essentially what we did was we kind of bundled, right? We bundled this group here to give you constructive overlap. And if you have constructive overlap between two atoms, that is the definition of a bond. And so here we have a bond between bang on, right? In between the nuclei that would be a sigma bond, right? That's a sigma bonding orbital. That's really important. So what we just discovered, if you look back at Spartan, that is the combination of two, two times the two PZ. So we've got essentially the sigma bond made by two two PZs. And you might say, well, wait a minute, these don't look symmetrical. You notice these guys are a little bit bigger. 
Well, that's because you kind of mixed, right? You kind of mixed a little bit of S in there from Spartan and it made these get a little bit more bulbous or a little bit bigger, kind of blown out a little bit. And that's a little bit of that S orbital that you're seeing in there. Otherwise, these might be very similar in size. And so that's okay, don't worry too much about that. The idea here is mainly that we see two P orbitals overlapping in a constructive way to give us a bond. And that's really, really important. Okay, so what I would do then is I would come back to my, my, my little drawing here and I would say that essentially what we can do now is we can say that HOMO is a sigma, right? This is a sigma bonding. And if you look at that, look at that, there's an S with a positive. That's a, that's a little tip off that that's a sigma, the S. You don't need to worry about the positive right now, but the S is a good idea for sigma. And what do you think pi is? Yeah, pi, kind of cool. In fact, let's look at HOMO minus one. If we look at HOMO minus one, what do we have here? We've got well, nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, only 2PY. And if you look at this one, nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. Ah, oh, this looks like 2PY. And notice they have both negative signs, so they have the same uh, orientation. So I bet you for HOMO minus one, you're gonna get something like this, where you have two P orbitals that look like that, you're gonna get above and below. And I'll just shade, you know, I'll call this positive and negative, which means you're gonna get something that I guess that looks kinda of like that. That's a pi bond, right? That's a pi bonding orbital, really important. And we can compare that to the LUMO. Let's go ahead and compare that to LUMO plus one. It uses the same orbitals in the PY. Here you have, what do you notice? You have nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, this one and this one, look, these are the same orbitals, but they're opposite, right? So when they're opposite, this is probably gonna happen. So if you look at LUMO plus one, you have the same matchup in ligand, or in, uh, in orbitals, excuse me, um, but they're not aligned for constructive interference. They are aligned for destructive interference. And so you end up getting something kind of like this weird guy, we're gonna go look at these in a minute. And here you have a new node. Whenever you have a new node, that's bad news bearers. That's not a bond, that's an anti-bond. You've got a node going right through the middle. That's terrible, that's high energy. And that's why you can see LUMO is higher than HOMO minus, or HOMO, LUMO plus one is higher than LUMO minus one because look at the difference here. You created a node and that's really neat. And so you can begin to see how the pi um, is contrasted to the sigma. And so let's go ahead and look at these for a second. So we're gonna look at HOMO minus one. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up my calculation here. I'm gonna unclick this one. I'm gonna add a surface. I'm gonna do HOMO minus one. I'm gonna look at that, bring this guy up. And what do you notice? That, my friends, is sort of a poster child for a pi bond. You can see that above and below overlap. That is really, really important. So there you go. Now granted, you can have a pi in two directions. So you can have pi in this direction and pi coming in and out of the paper and they will be degenerate. That is, they should have the same energy. So let's see if we can find that. And so HOMO minus one is what? 14.92, HOMO minus two is 14.92. So number HOMO minus two and HOMO minus one are degenerate. They have the same energy. That's really cool. And if you look, I will challenge you to see that this is also a pi bonding orbital. Really cool. The same thing happens here for HOMO minus, or sorry, for LUMO plus one and LUMO plus, or just LUMO. You can see here that these two are both pi in symmetry or pi in orientation. In fact, it's even told to you here, pi. Um, and they have exactly the same energy. 7.21, 7.21, those are degenerate. Really kind of cool. In fact, let's look at one of those. I'll look at LUMO, right? So I'll shut this one down and we'll look at LUMO. And I'll open this up and look at that. Look at that. You see that anti-bonding orientation here where that new node is going right through. And whenever you have a node in between the atoms, now granted you can have a node on the atom and that's fine. But if you have a node between, that means you have zero probability of finding electrons between two nuclei, which is the <laughs> exact opposite of what a bond is. So that is an anti-bond. So there you go. That's really kind of cool to see there. And again, you can have one in this direction and one coming in and out. Those are degenerate, which, which are really, really cool. Okay, the last thing we'll look at 
probably the simplest one here is let's go all the way down to home minus four. If you look at home minus four, what do you got? You got in this case, the 2s from nitrogen, right? And a little bit of 2p, that's kind of neat. Here, we're, we'll see what this means in a little bit. You got this kind of mixing of s and p's that looks kind of cool. Um, but in this case, I'd say the big boss is gonna be the two s's. And so if you have a s with a positive and an s with a positive, right? You're gonna have something on the arrangement like a, you know, I have homo minus four over here in the notes, right? Homo minus four. That's because you've got one big S orbital, one big S orbital, and that's gonna make this big kind of sausage thing, which is gonna be a sigma bond, right? Really, really important. And if you look at the next one, you're gonna have homo minus three is gonna be a negative and a positive. So that means it's gonna be the opposite, right? So if we go up here, it's gonna be homo minus three, you're gonna have the same orientation, but different phases. So now you're gonna have anti-bonding orientation here with a big new node in the middle, that's gonna be a sigma star. And now you can see the energy difference of those two. And I would argue for homo minus four, that's a really strong constructive overlap, which is why that negative 38 energy is maintained because that's, that's really cool, really stabilizing. So we can go down here to Spartan. We can shut that one down and we'll go look for homo minus two or homo minus four rather for that lowest one. And if we look at that, look at that. You can see that nice big oval of S and S interaction. And if we go and look at the little bit higher one, the homo minus three, we can look at that one. And you see that really nicely shown uh, node right in the middle, two lobes in opposite colors that tell you that this is anti-bonding. You have the constructive homo minus four and the destructive homo minus three orientation of those orbitals. The only other one that we have left to explore is the little bit more complicated one, which is LUMO plus two. And if you think about that as the alternate example to what I had over here, right? You can see that, you can say, okay. And the first, this was our, our constructive addition, right? To give us the bonding. Now we'll look at the destructive, right? Here we're gonna have the same kind of setup, but unlike before, we're gonna keep them in the same kind of orientation pointing the other way. And again, each one has a node because it's a P orbital. P orbitals have nodes anyway. Now you'll notice here, we're gonna get a new node because these two, unlike the example up above, these are gonna be um, deconstructive. And so here we're gonna have a new node introduced so when we add them, we're gonna get this, oh man, this is gonna be a mess. Um, you're gonna have positive, negative, positive, negative with one, two, three nodes. Those are pretty crazy. And so that is clearly gonna be, you've got a node between the atoms, right? You've got nitrogen, nitrogen, there's no bond there. That is gonna be sigma star. That is what we call anti-bonding, and that's really important. Okay, so um, that gives you a good example, and we'll just go ahead and look at that to make sure I'm not lying to you. That was uh, the LUMO, so we'll add the, the LUMO there. No, that was LUMO plus three, right? Sorry. No, LUMO plus two, excuse me. Okay, so LUMO plus two, we can look at that. LUMO plus two, not so difficult. We'll throw that in there. Let's take a look and almost exactly like we drew it. Here you have one, two, three color changes, three different nodes, the highest energy orbital that we have. Really, really important. Okay, so I think that has, in a way, given you the ability to kind of look at these. And so now we're gonna actually build a molecular orbital diagram from these. And so at this point, you have all the information you need to fill out this table. So make sure you fill out the table on the next page, kind of telling me just like we did before, what is the energy of each orbital? What does the sketch look like? And what are the main atomic orbitals that are contributing with their actual coefficient values? And once you've done that, you can, if you wanna pause and take a minute to do that, you can do that. But let's go ahead and begin to build a, a diagram for this. And so it's gonna be a little bit more complicated, but not too complicated. Okay, so we're gonna have energy here. 
and we're gonna say, okay, I've got a nitrogen on each side, and nitrogen, right, I'm gonna have a, a what? I'm gonna have a 2S, and I'm gonna have a 1, 2, 3, 2P, right? Now, it's important that you draw these energies identically because these are identical atoms, so their energies are gonna be exactly the same, and that's really important. Nitrogen has, what, five valence electrons, right? There we go, we gotta put those valence electrons in there, really important, make sure you can do electron configurations. And again, we are only looking at the valence electrons, really, really important. So, if we think about what we had up top, our lowest energy one was the one made by the, we had what, we had a negative 38 and then negative 19, so we could put these down here, right, we can say, I'm not going to draw it exactly to scale, but it's basically negative 39, uh, negative 19. And these were made from primarily the two S's. Now you will argue perhaps that, well, Dr. Poor, you told us that the, the PZs mixed a little bit. That's true, they did, and we'll talk about that later. But for right now, let's, let's pick the one that has the highest coefficient, and I'm pretty sure it was the, um, the two S's in both those cases. This would be the sigma. This would be the sigma star, and if you want to, that's sigma SS because it was made from the, the S orbital, so I kind of put that in there. And if you go up here to the next one, the next one is going to be a what? Negative 14.92, negative 14.92. Ooh, that's, those are exactly the same. So I'm gonna go ahead and put these exactly the same energy at negative 14 EV, right? And I'm gonna call those pi orbitals, and they were made from the primarily the 2p, the 2p what x and y. The next one is our, I think what is our negative 14? Yeah, negative 14, right? There we go, we can put that one here. It's pretty close, negative 14. It's not exactly, you can, I'm just rounding, you can do this. And those came from the pz's, right? That was a z. And I'm gonna call that sigma bonding. And then the next one, what, you have two of the uh, positive seven, right? So it's gonna be positive seven EV. And those were X and Y, but those are our pi star. Those are the antibonding, and they came from the 2P. And our very last one, way up here at like positive 28 EV is our Z, which comes from the P orbitals as well. You don't have to draw them to the particular ones, right? Because they're X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z, but there you go. And so now we have to say, did we account for all of our eight orbitals? Yeah, looks like it. And then we have to make sure we have 10 electrons. So now we basically look at the orbitals as belonging to the molecule now. So this would be the molecular orbital diagram in the middle. Um, and so we have 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you always fill them from the bottom up. Don't skip, don't jump, just go ahead and uh, go ahead and fill from the bottom up. When you have two at the same energy, you go one, two, three, four, and then there you go. Now you can see this is homo, homo minus one, homo minus two, homo minus three, homo minus four, just like we saw up above. This is lumo, lumo plus one, lumo plus two. Now, I'll put a little disclaimer here. Sometimes some books will call, if you have two things at the same level, they will just call this whole level the LUMO, right? That's fine. Um, I would say that this would be clearly identified as the HOMO. This group would be identified as the LUMO, right? This would be our HOMO-LUMO gap if we wanted to calculate that, as we talked about above. Um, but what's bad is Spartan has to treat each MO as a separate thing. So it will typically just call one of these LUMO, one of these LUMO plus one, LUMO, one of those is LUMO plus two. So, you know, so be it. Um, but it does typically go from the HOMO-LUMO gap, HOMO on down, LUMO on up, just like we did before, and there you go. So that's pretty cool. And I think that gives you a lot of um, insight into how do you read these, how do you look at these pictures, and what do you do? And so this is really important. You gotta be able to do this kind of stuff or you're gonna be uh, way behind. So now is a really good time. If you need to go back and review, try to do that. I will try to hold maybe an office hour uh, later in the week if that's helpful. But now you have everything you need to do to move on to both um, the challenge here of oxygen and the challenge of carbon monoxide um, later on. And so 
both carbon monoxide and um, all these diatomics are kind of done the same way. Um, I'll give you a little hint for carbon monoxide, but first I want to talk a little bit about why we should have any kind of belief that these are useful calculations. And well, remember we talked a little bit about in nanotechnology about X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. We talked about it in um, 111 when we dealt with uh, chemistry 111 when we dealt with molecular, I mean, sorry, atomic orbitals and why we should believe that there's evidence that supports them. And so I want to kind of just give you an example, right? Remember how we talked about uh, energy and then we talked about, right, we said 1s, uh, 2s, you know, then you did 2p, then you did 3s, and so on and so forth, right? Well, that information comes from this experiment and this photoelectron spectroscopy is really important. Remember, you have some sample and you bring in a, an X-ray, right? The X-ray has a lot of energy. It hits this and it kicks out an electron. We call that a photoelectron because it was kicked out by a photon. And we can measure the energy of this, right? And we can measure the energy of the X-ray. And the difference in the energy of these two is the energy required to kick it out. That is the binding energy, or oftentimes for an atom, it can be the ionization energy, right? Really kind of cool there. So, um, oh goodness, what's going on here? Okay, there we go, a little bit better. Okay, so what I wanna show you is this idea then that, where did you, where, what, what does this tell us? And so what I actually did is I went and looked up um, from way back in the day, um, the actual spectrum of, of, of nitrogen and the spectrum of oxygen, and so, all I want to show you here is, is that we have essentially energy. And this is going to be a little bit different. You'll notice numbers get bigger as you go down. And that's because these values are negative. So forgive me for, for showing you data that looks kind of weird. And then this value here, this value you see here is essentially the number of electrons or the, the, the amount of electrons that were kicked off in the experiment. And that's, that's really important, right? And let's see here, I don't know, there we go, a little bit better. Let me turn this back on for some reason. It's, it's the pin's kind of getting goofy on me. Okay, so what I wanna show you is that you notice these weird peaks that are pointing this way. So every time there's a, a number of electron captured, uh, we can record the, the energy of that. And what I'm gonna show you is that these weird kind of things are kind of essentially peaks. So I'm gonna draw this as a peak and we're just gonna call this a peak this big cluster over here, we're gonna kinda of call as a peak. And then this value here, we're gonna call as a peak as well. And what do you notice? Okay, now granted this spectrum only shows us a small part. It doesn't show you everything, but if you look here, you see how this one is labeled sigma star this one is labeled pi, and this one's really hard to see, but is essentially gonna be um, your, um, let's see, what do we got here? This is gonna be your um, your sigma, sigma bonding. Yeah, that's sigma bonding. Okay, so what do you notice? This is a, essentially a chunk of our value up above, right? If you go back to our, our diagram here, what do you notice? Well, what's cool about this is that it is essentially showing you a chunk of this diagram right here, right? And so let's, let's go back down and look. What am I talking about? I know you think I'm, I'm being crazy here. Okay, what it's showing you is it's showing you the order. And so let's take a look. So this peak here, this peak is a sigma star from the S. And so remember down here would have been sigma bonding, but here's, that's probably too low an energy for this window. Remember this spectrum is only showing you part of it. Um, and then here you see you have, so basically this tells you you have one electron and it's about, you know, we'll call this one one. This one is twice as big it represents two, and it's it rep representing basically the ratio of electrons. So if I say, okay, this is one, two, this is one, two, three, four, and this one is one, two. You can see here that you have one to one to two, right? So that's kind of shows you what these peaks are if you take that area. 
this guy is going to be our pi and this one is going to be our sigma p and here's pi p and so if you go back and you can see the ordering is really important so if you think about your diagram right you're going to have your sigma your sigma s your sigma star s and you're going to have that you know what we saw before right you had that and then you had two and then you had one then up here you had two and then you had one right you would have if you had your whole diagram uh, pi star and sigma star it doesn't show you the whole thing we go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten now you'll notice why don't you see these well the reason you don't see these is because there's no electrons in them and if there are no electrons in them guess what you can't kick out an electron so photoelectron spectroscopy only shows you peaks for orbitals that have at least one electron in them and this is a really nice thing to show you the ordering now granted you can't see this one because it's not on the chart but what we do see are these three orbitals in the exact same order that spartan showed us now granted the numerical values don't line up exactly in terms of the energies but spartan gets the ordering right and it gets the number of electrons in each one right and it matches up quite well quite quite well to our diagram up above now what I'll show you, what I'd like to challenge you to do is once you're done, compare your data to for oxygen to the spectrum here. And I think this one really shows you that you have, you know, here's a peak here, here's a peak here, here's a big peak here, and here's a big peak here, right? It's kind of hard to see the exact, I'm kind of just fudging here to show you, but what you see here is what you have, what you have in this case, your sigma star for the 2s, right? So this would be sigma star uh, s. This would be, um, you're gonna be your first sigma bonding for the p's. This is gonna be your pi's for the p. And then this is gonna be your pi star for the p. Now notice here that this is very different, or not very different, but a little bit different than what you saw above. The ordering is flipped. And that's because you see here you have, for the experimental value, you go for uh, S, P, and, and so look at these two here. Here you have for the P value, right? You would have what this is gonna be um, sigma S, this would be sigma star S, and this one's gonna be um, sigma P, this one's gonna be pi P, pi star P, and then sigma star P. Kind of neat, right? And what you'll notice is that the energies for the sigma p and the pi p are flipped. And that's kind of neat. And Dr. Cook probably talks about this a bit. And you might say, well, you know, I don't really understand why that happens. Well, it ends up happening, everything up to nitrogen on that row, if you form diatomics, right, has this first arrangement. And then oxygen and fluorine have this arrangement. And that's really cool. And I'm going to kind of just really quickly tell you why that is. If you notice back when we did nitrogen, when we did nitrogen, especially for some of those low-lying orbitals, we had a combination of S mixing with P. Remember I said, don't worry about so much, but when S is mixed with P, you end up getting the first order, the nitrogen order. And that's because as you have, uh, as you go from left to right on the periodic table, what happens? Your effective nuclear charge goes up. And as your effective nuclear charge goes up, the gap between your 2s and your 2p orbitals gets bigger and bigger and bigger. When you're at nitrogen, you're not very far across the periodic table. And so, uh, well, you're moving your way across the periodic table, but up until nitrogen, the effective nuclear charge is so low that your s and p orbital energies are so close together, they can kind of mix a little bit. They're, they're, they're reasonably close together in energy, so they can mix. And by mixing, I mean they can contribute to the same molecular orbital. However, when you get the oxygen, it's just found or observed in this case that the order shifts. And so what happens is oxygen is the first element in that row that has a high enough effective nuclear charge that the energy difference between the S's and the P's is so big that you diminish that SP mixing. And so that doesn't happen anymore and you end up flipping the order that I just talked about. And so that's why sometimes in your book, it'll just kind of hand wave you say, ah, just memorize this. But I think Spartan does a good job of this, and this data, this real experimental data, shows that this level of Spartan calculation is very useful. And so I hope this is helpful to you in trying to understand the difference here, and the question I think will get at that. And it'll make more sense once you go back and do oxygen. So anyway, I hope that helps. The last thing I want to do, now don't forget to do carbon monoxide. You can do that, it's very, very similar. Um, I will kind of give you a hint here. 
Um, you know, this is something that's a pet peeve of mine that I want you to avoid. Remember, we're talking about energies here. So if we're dealing with carbon and oxygen, you have to be really careful, right? You'll have a 2S and a 2P, but notice that in every example we've done before, we've used the same element and we've just drawn them identically the same. However, that's not the case here. Carbon and oxygen are not the same element, right? So they'll have a different number of valence electrons, but also just as important, they will have a different energy level. And that's because as you go across the periodic table, you get a higher effective nuclear charge. And so carbon has a lower effective nuclear charge than oxygen. So it's atom or sorry its electrons are held more tightly and that means they're going to be lower in energy and so we have to make sure that if we have oxygen it's going to be lower in energy its 2s orbitals are lower in energy because it would take more electro more energy to pull an electron out of oxygen than it would for carbon right and then also the 2p are going to be lower as well and so please make sure that you show me that these are not identical they do not align, right? They have different energies. And if you don't believe me, go look up the ionization energies. They are very different. And so that's really important. So that's a good hint. Uh, and also don't forget the number of valence electrons. For carbon, one, two, three, four. For oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you notice, this has 10 electrons. 